Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar, which is presented by Environment One. The focus of today's webinar is on hydrogen auxiliary systems and how to get the maximum information for the buck. Our presenter today is Steve Kilmartin. He's the Director of Products and Markets for E1's Utility Sur uh, Systems Business. Considered a leading expert in the field of generator monitoring and maintenance, he has authored numerous papers, including work as principal investigator for the F3 Turbine Generator Auxiliary System, Volume 3, Generator Hydrogen System Maintenance Guide. Mr. Kilmartin began his career with E1 in 1988 as an, an instrument specialist. Now, prior to that, he worked in the instrument shop at GE and also as an applications engineer at Mechanical Technology Incorporated in New York. His career has taken him around and large machines and also around the world for more than 30 years, and we're so pleased to have him today. Now, we are going to be taking your questions following the presentation. To submit, just look to the right-hand side of your screen, and you'll see a section to submit your questions. And now, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Steve Kilmartin. Thank you, Peggy. Generator auxiliary systems include the lube oil system, the seal oil system, excitation system, stator cooling water systems for generators that have water-cooled stator windings. Sometimes the controls and monitoring could be included as a, an auxiliary system, and the hydrogen cooling system. This presentation will cover the hydrogen cooling system. Today we're going to do a quick review on why hydrogen, why is hydrogen used as a cooling gas. We're going to talk about the need for more information and why we need more information. We'll talk about the need for safety when dealing with hydrogen. We'll talk about and show a basic H2 auxiliary system. We will look at an optimum. H2 auxiliary system. We will also talk about additional uh, monitoring equipment that's used on hydrogen cooled generators. Then we will discuss uh, the process of purging a generator and we'll go through an example of how to do that. And at the very end we will talk about leaks and leak detection. Why hydrogen? Why do we use hydrogen? Well, hydrogen uh, has less windage and frictional losses. It's, uh, the relative density of hydrogen is four times less than, less than air. What does this mean? That means you can spin the rotor of a generator a lot easier in hydrogen than if that rotor is in air. And hydrogen also has uh, better heat characteristics, transfer characteristics than air. Hydrogen is 14 times more efficient at removing heat than air is. And when you're generating electricity, you're creating heat, and hydrogen is much more effective in removing the heat from those components than when you cool with air. The bottom line is you get more megawatts per pound of iron. Currently, there are over 10,000 hydrogen-cooled generators in use around the world. And although hydrogen is a great coolant gas, there are issues. Hydrogen is very explosive. Hydrogen is colorless and odorless and tasteless. Therefore, it's very hard to detect. Hydrogen is difficult to, to contain because the molecules are very small. It's hard to keep hydrogen inside the generator vessel. And there are materials that are not 
compatible with hydrogen, so you have to be careful of, about, of what is being used in a hydrogen environment. This triangle is very important throughout this presentation. You need uh, three elements to have a fire or an explosion. You need air, you need fuel, and you need the ignition. And what we are talking about, hydrogen, that is the fuel. You want to keep the other two elements away when you're dealing with hydrogen. Even well-designed and well-manufactured generators can become compromised by serious operational challenges, some of which are outside the control of the power plant. However, we do know if proper standard operating procedures are not followed, you can have some very serious problems, including equipment damage and, in some cases, loss of lives. This generator was located, is located in South Africa. The root cause of this problem was not the generator itself. What happened is that the turbine that drives the generator lost some blades. The rotor of the turbine became imbalanced. Uh, the rotor, turbine rotor is connected to the generator rotor, and as such, the generator rotor became imbalanced. And the seals, seals that are designed to keep the hydrogen inside the generator failed because of this vibration and imbalance. As a result, oil and hydrogen leaked out of the generator. The, and, and what we're looking at here, the oil and the hydrogen leaked out of this area of the generator into the exciter cab. And we discussed those three elements for an explosion, air, fuel, and the arcing source or igniter. Well, inside a collector cab, you have arcing and sparking that has taken place. Hydrogen leaked in there. You had air, and that's what caused the explosion. You can see that the explosion blew the exciter housing off of the generator. So this is what we're trying to avoid. Why do we need more information? There are many generators in operation that are very old, and these generators still have original auxiliary equipment on them that was supplied by the generator manufacturer. This third point is a very important point. The workforce is getting younger. In the last 10 years, a lot of power plant workers that had a lot of experience have retired. And the training programs and apprentice programs that are in place now are not as good as what they used to be years ago. And the workforce is getting leaner. When I first got into this business, it was not unusual to have upward to 100 people in a large coal plant, running a, a large coal plant. Those numbers have been cut drastically. Also, the time between outages is increasing. Again, years ago when I got into this business, it was not unusual to have an outage every year or two. Now outages are being pushed out as long as 10 years. This creates a, a, a major issue regarding experience. When generators are purged frequently, you, you gain experience because you're doing it every year or two. When generators are purged every 10 years, it's, it's possible that the plant has people on it that have never purged a generator before. So you, it, 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 because of that, you better have well-written procedures. Also, generators are not opened up as frequently as they used to. It is very important in this case to know what has taken place inside that generator. More information. And the last point, generators are being cycled, which puts 
a lot of stress, not only on the generator, but on all power plant equipment, including people. Because of the price of natural gas, roles are somewhat being reversed. Gas turbines that were designed to be peaking units are being used as base load units. And large steam units, which were originally designed to be base load units, are being cycled. These, amp these points amplify the need for more information. Because of the conditions listed in the previous slide, it is very important that safe practices are documented and, and followed. Uh, it, as we're discussing, hydrogen is equals a hazard, equals problems. You need well-documented standard operating procedures and accurate P&IDs, piping and instrumentation drawings. You need equipment and tools uh, designed and rated to be used in hazardous locations. Equipment that is being used in hazardous locations should be certified to be used in this, uh, in this type of a location. Uh, in that regard, different countries have different standards. The United States uh, will follow the North American Electric Code. In Europe, they'll follow ATEX or IECEX. In countries such as Russia and South Korea have different standards that they follow. The next couple of slides are of piping diagrams of the generator, a P&ID with basic equipment, and a P&ID with maximum equipment. And then I take the P&ID with maximum equipment and I break it down into two areas uh, just for clarity. It makes it easier to see the diagram. On this generator, uh, I wanted to point out a, a couple things. First of all, the hydrogen, and, and by the way, I use high carbon dioxide as a purge gas in, in this situation. But the carbon dioxide will come in through a bottom distribution pipe. This line is the carbon dioxide feed line. The hydrogen will come in through the top distribution pipe. And you can just see this is the hydrogen feed. Both of these lines will serve as a vent line during the purge process, which we'll see when I get into that portion of the presentation. And then over uh, here on the left-hand side, you can see there's two connections. These are connections that will go to your hydrogen cabinet or your hydrogen analyzer. One of these lines are connected to the generator fan pressure. The other line is connected to the generator fan suction, and we rely on the rotor and the rotor fan to create a differential pressure that will move hydrogen to the cabinet so that we can monitor that. A point that I'd like to make is that during the purging process, you do not want to use this point for your analyzer. Instead, you want to connect to where the gas is being vented from the generator. This is a basic P&ID system that you might find on a generator. Just to go over some of the points or of, the, of this diagram, uh, up here you have the CO2 supply connection, which would go to the CO2 tank farm. You have the H2 supply, which would go to the H2 tank farm. And then you have an air supply, which in most cases is connected to clean, dry instrument air within the, the power plant. You can see that we have pressure relief valves for the CO2 line. We have a pressure relief valve for the hydrogen supply line. And then here is a very important component. It's a spool piece that is used to allow either hydrogen or air to be put into the generator. This spool minimizes 
the chances of air being mixed with hydrogen. Again, that triangle we discussed. It will minimize the chances. However, it does not keep it from happening. It does not eliminate the chances. It's still possible to mix air with hydrogen in the generator. The spool piece will only minimize that. Then we have a pressure control valve. This is used during normal operation. During the purging or filling of the generator, we'll go open this valve. During normal operation, we will use the pressure control valve, which will control the pressure in the generator. Some power plants choose not to use this, but will manually top off the hydrogen pressure uh, when it drops below certain levels. And then this valving here is used to put the gas in and out of the generator. Here we have the hydrogen line, which would go to that top header that we pointed out in the previous slide. This CO2 line goes to the bottom header. And then this line goes to vent. Over here, we have the instrumentation section. And the, those two lines that I spoke of earlier, these two lines here, those are my connection points, the generator fan pressure, generator fan suction. The pressure line comes in through a filter, goes through a flow meter, through the analyzer, which is monitoring the purity of the gas, and then back to the generator. We also have a differential pressure indicator here, which gives a remote or it gives a local indication of what the differential pressure is. And then we have a pressure indicator that's monitoring the case pressure. In the event that the generator is offline and on turning gear and you don't have the rotor turning, so you don't have a differential pressure, and you still want to monitor your hydrogen purity, we would rely on this line here for pressure. And then we change this valve to go to vent. So now we're getting a uh, flow through the analyzer as a result of the pressure in the generator and not the differential pressure of the generator. This is a PNID of a, what uh, we refer to as a max case or optimum situation. Uh, it's got much more instrumentation, which I'm going to discuss uh, in detail, but I'm going to break this into two sections. I refer to this as a supply section, and then I'll refer to this as the instrumentation section. Uh, you can see that here's a better view where you can see the hydrogen coming up, going into the top header, the CO2 going into the bottom header, and then this generator's got two liquid level detectors that have outputs that are feeding the control room, the electrical outputs. Sorry about that. Um, this is the analyzer portion of the PNID. And again, I've got the generator fan pressure. On this PNID, we got a, uh, a drip leg to uh, trap oil that might be enter into the system. On this system, we've got two analyzers, redundant analyzers. Uh, this is a becoming a common practice in Europe where they, they want redundancy in all of their instrumentation. So we've got two analyzers. The, the flow would go through the analyzers back to the generator. Again, we have a, a liquid or a drip leg on this generator. Now, just because the hydrogen is going in this direction does not mean that oil cannot flow back in the unit. So we do, we do put a uh, drip leg on the inlet and the outlet. We have on this generator a differential fan indicator, differential fan pressure indicator, and also a transmitter. 
that will send a 4 to 20 milliamp signal back to the control room. So you have a local indication and you have a remote indication. We have a transmitter for the case pressure that will send a 4 to 20 milliamp signal back to the control room and we have an indicator so that again we get local indication and remote indication and also redundancy. On this generator we had a pressure switch, two pressure switches, one for high pressure and one for low pressure. So we got a bit more instrumentation here providing a bit more information to the operators. This is the, the, the supply portion of that PNID. Now the added instrumentation that we have on this is that on the CO2 supply, we're monitoring the, we're giving a local indication. We have a pressure indicator to give local indication and we have a pressure transmitter that will send again the 4 to 20 milliamp signal back to the control room. Also on the hydrogen supply, we have a pressure indicator that is giving a local indication of the hydrogen supply pressure, and again, a pressure transmitter that is sending a 4 to 20 milliamp back to the control room. An interesting point or feature of this uh, system is that they have a mass flow meter in, 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 in line so that during the operation of the generator, they can monitor what the hydrogen usage is. If you don't have a mass flow meter, then you monitor your hydrogen usage by knowing how many bottles of hydrogen you're going through every day. But this is becoming a more popular feature to know, have an electric signal that's telling you what your hydrogen usage is. Uh, some generators actually will have a mass flow meter for their CO2 and another mass flow meter so when they're filling the generator with hydrogen so that they know what their CO2 usage is, their hydrogen usage is during the filling of the generator and the hydrogen usage is during normal operation of the generator. Neither of these two systems describe or cover equipment that would be located at the H2 tank farm or the CO2 tank farm, such as pressure regulators and pressure gauges or scales that are used to weigh the CO2. Online monitoring devices are important tools needed to maintain the reliability and to assure optimum performance of the generator and this is becoming more critical uh, because of our current operating situation. As risk factors in the fleet increase, additional monitoring becomes necessary. This is a simple graph but I think it tells a good story in that when you buy a generator you get a certain level of OEM supplied equipment. As the risk of that generator increase on this side, we recommend that you increase the level of monitoring equipment that you have. So again, as risk increase, you want to increase the level of monitoring equipment. But what, what causes the risk to go up? That could be the age of the generator. It could be the size of the generator, how big is the generator, how many megawatts the generator is producing. It could be how critical is that generator to the fleet or to the grid. It could be because operational or operator experiences. There, this generator, your generator could be of a design where other power plants have had issues with the generator. And this might be the same design. So you it's possible that you could experience those same issues. And again, the plant staffing level. The, as, the, uh, as the level of people that are operating a plant goes down, you, you want to increase the uh, number, amount of information 
that you're getting from the generator. Here are examples of some additional hydrogen related equipment or, or sensors. Most generators will come with uh, cold gas and hot gas temperature sensors. Additional temperature sensors could be used to monitor the temperature of the core, monitor the temperature of the back of the core, and these are just some examples. Monitor the core flux screen, or on generators that have stator cooling water systems, you could monitor the temperature of the uh, stator cooling water. A flux probe uh, could be used. Uh, they're used to detect uh, shorted turns and rotor windings. You could use a generator condition monitor. They're used to detect generator overheating. The generator condition monitor will not prevent the overheating, but it will give you an early enough warning so corrective action can be taken to minimize the generator damage. You could have additional vibration sensors, and these sensors could monitor end turn vibration or frame vibration. Dew point monitoring. High dew points in generators can lead to some serious issues, such as insulation breakdown or retaining ring failure. It is very important that dew point in generators be monitored, and if it is above the OEM recommended point, a dryer should be used to keep these dew points at an acceptable level. Rotor shaft voltage monitors can be used to detect voltages that could result in current discharges and electrical pit pitting on critical rotor surfaces. Again, these are just some examples of additional monitoring equipment that can be used on hydrogen cooled generators. Other equipment that could be listed are CO2 vaporizers. CO2 vaporizers used to heat CO2 before it goes into the generator, uh, or, or systems that actually make hydrogen. I want to spend a few minutes discussing gassing and degassing a generator or purging a generator. I have discussed this in previous webinars, but I think it's important enough to discuss again. Since not knowing how to purge or properly purge a generator could lead to some major issues, again, including loss of life. As I mentioned, in, as I mentioned earlier, outages are becoming less frequent. And as a result, power plant people may not have experience purging a generator. So having good procedures and equipment are critical. The next two slides list things that I recommend you have to uh, perform, to properly perform a uh, purging, purging of the generator. You want to have updated and understood standard operating procedure. You want to have a current and accurate P&ID. You want to verify that the valves are properly labeled and agree with the P&ID. These first three points are critical, and the reason being is that I've been in power plants where equipment on the hydrogen system, hydrogen auxiliary system, some equipment is added and some equipment is taken out. And when that happens, the standard operating procedure and the the P&ID might not be updated when that equipment is either added or, 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 or taken out. So it's very important that your standard operating procedure and your P&ID and your valves are all in alignment and current and accurate. You want to verify that your generator gas analyzer is calibrated and working properly. I also recommend that a portable gas analyzer be, be used during the purging process. This gives you a redundant reading, second uh, 
uh, two out of two voting, if you will, that your what your gas actually is. I recommend that a portable hydrogen sniffer be used. And if you're not using a portable hydrogen sniffer, I recommend that liquid leak detector or SNOOP be used. And why do I make this recommendation? Again, we're not purging generators that frequently. So that means the valves that are being used to purge the generator are not being exercised that much. Where again, a valve might have been exercised every year or two, now they're not being exercised for maybe a 10 year period. And as a result, the O-rings or the seating or packing in the valve might become stiff and might not be sealing as well as it should be. And, and, and your chances of a hydrogen leak increase. And that's why I recommend the use of a portable hydrogen sniffer during the purging process and liquid uh, leak detector. I also recommend that personnel that are, uh, that are performing the purge that are located down at the gas manifold that they wear uh, low explosive limit level detectors so that if there is hydrogen present it will be detected. They also might want to measure oxygen or have oxygen detectors with them also. I recommend the use of non-sparking tools. You're working in a hazardous area and you don't want to be used, using tools that could create a spark. You want to make sure that you've got enough carbon dioxide to not only purge the generator that you're uh, working on, but also have enough to purge any generator that might have an emergency or a condition where you have to do an emergency purge. So you want to have the sufficient supply of carbon dioxide so that you can uh, purge all of your generators. You should create signage so that notes what gas is in a generator. And this signage would be located in the control room and at the hydrogen control cabinet or the gas manifold. I recommend that the air and the hydrogen supplies uh, have the, you have the ability to lock those out. Again, to minimize the chance of air and hydrogen being in the generator at the same time. Uh, and also, again, this won't eliminate, it will minimize the chance, but it will not eliminate the chance. Another recommendation I have that operations in INC uh, both be involved in the purging of the generator. And if, if, if you're not having both departments involved, at least have two people involved. I think it's a good idea to have one person reading the instructions or the standard operating procedure, and then another person looking at the uh, P&ID and controlling the valves. And I, I, I strongly think that uh, two sets of eyes are better than one set of eyes. This is a uh, a very simple P&ID that I will use to demonstrate the purging process. A very important point to note, which I noted before, is that during the purging process, you want to take your gas sample at a different location. You want to take the gas sample as the gas is going out the vent. You do not want to analyze the sample from these two points. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes why, I, uh, why you shouldn't be doing that. First, we're going to put air in the generator. Well, air is in the generator. What we're going to do is pressurize the generator to run the air test. So you'll note down in the corner here, I'm going to remove the hydrogen spool piece, the CO2 spool piece, and then I'm going to put the air spool piece in. I'm also going to set my valves up to allow air to feed into the generator and shut other valves off. So now I've got my valves set up, I got my spool piece set up, and I have my hydrogen isolated. So now I'm going to put air in the generator. Well, what, again, I'm not putting air in the generator, I'm pressurizing the air that's already in the generator. 
the air comes in through the bottom header, fills the generator up. Now during the air test, one of these valves may be open if you're using the case pressure gauge in the hydrogen control cabinet to measure the pressure during the pressure test. So it is possible that one of these valves may be open. So once we get the generator pressurized with air, we're going to shut the air supply off, and now we're going to run our pressure test uh, according to the OEM. Uh, and then once it is passed, the pressure test, now we're going to want to get rid of that air. Again, we don't want to mix air and hydrogen. So we want to get rid of that air with an inner gas. And in, in our case, we're using CO2. So I'm going to position my valves to put CO2 in the generator. So we disconnect the air spool. We connect the hydrogen, which doesn't really need to be connected at this point. And we connect the CO2 spool. We open the valves to put CO2 in the generator. And then so CO2 will come in the bottom of the generator. The lighter air will come out the top header and go out to that. We will again analyze at this point, not this point. As the reason being that I'm going to start to put CO2 in the generator. When CO2 comes into the generator, CO2 being a very heavy gas, as soon as I start to get CO2 in the case, these two analyzers would see pure CO2, even though the top part of the generator could have air in it. So that's why we want to monitor the gas purity during the purging process as the gases exiting the generator are going to vent. Now that we've got CO2 in the generator, it's safe to put hydrogen in the generator. We got all the air out. So I am now going to put hydrogen, position my valves, close my CO2 valves, open my hydrogen valve, uh, use my CO2 bottom header as a vent to get rid of the, the heavier CO2. So we'll put hydrogen in the generator. Now we've got the, the lighter hydrogen coming into the generator through the top hever, header. It will push the heavier CO2 out the bottom header, out the vent, and again, we're analyzing as the gas is exiting the generator. Now that the generator is filled with hydrogen, it's safe to operate the generator. So we position our valves uh, accordingly. And we've got our, now we're, now we're monitoring the purity of the hydrogen in the hydrogen control cabinet because we have a differential pressure in the generator. Um, and I'm, I'm going to bypass uh, these next processes because it's just a reverse of what I've, I've done. Uh, so we, we won't see what the CO2 fill is or the air fill. Now, as I, the, some of the equipment that I recommended, I did recommend that a portable gas analyzer be used. This will give you a redundant reading, uh, again, two out of two voting of what the gas actually is in the generator during the, the purging process. I strongly recommend the use of a portable gas analyzer. I also recommend the use, as I said, of a hydrogen sniffer. This is a picture of a hydrogen sniffer. And this is a portable device that you can carry around at the gas manifold. And it does just what its name says. It detects hydrogen. I, again, I recommend the use of a low explosive limit detector. These are personal that are uh, strapped on your belt. 
and I, anyone that is in the hydrogen area uh, should be wearing these. And then I also recommend that non-sparking tools be used in the generator. I'm going to talk a little bit on locating and qualifying leaks. Because a generator case is a pressurized vessel, there are numerous locations where hydrogen can leak. Some examples of where hydrogen can leak are into the hydrogen coolers. Hydrogen can be entrained in the seal oil or leak through pipes, connections, or covers on the generator. <coughs> Hydrogen can leak into the statter water on generators that have uh, statter water cooling systems. Hydrogen leaks can also occur in the auxiliary equipment that is connected to the generator. The allowable daily leakage is always specified by the manufacturer, and it is determined by hydrogen usage. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, some generators are equipped with mass flow meters to monitor hydrogen usage. The other way you do that is you uh, just know how many bottles of hydrogen you're using every day. Different methods can be used to detect leaks. Some examples are the old standby liquid, liquid soap. You can use ultrasonic leak detectors. Hydrogen sniffers, as we shown, uh, as shown earlier, or you can use infrared leak detectors. Although hydrogen will dissipate dissipate very quickly, it is important you know areas in the gener where, generator where hydrogen can accumulate, such as in enclosures or in housings like uh, your your hydrogen control cabinet. A best practice for hydrogen leak detection is to use detailed, a detailed pictorial guide to show personnel where to inspect for hydrogen leaks. All plants should have well-written procedures to, for locating uh, hydrogen leaks. If you do not have one, you should get in touch with another plant that does and modify it accordingly. The following are, are, are examples where hydrogen leaks can occur. These are liquid level detectors. You noted those on a, an earlier PNID. These are connected to the generator case. These are pressurized with hydrogen. Uh, some plants may choose to shut the valves off so that the pressurized hydrogen is only coming up to here, but this is still a leak point. These are still under pressure, so this is still a leak point. These, these fittings are, are leak points. And if they have these valves open uh, during normal operation, all of these points are leak points. So this is the, these liquid level detectors are a potential area where you can have a hydrogen leak. This is a generator bushing. Again, these are just examples. This is a generator bushings where the voltage ex exits the generator. These bushings have seals. Around the bottom, there's a flange plate around here where the, the, there's a seal. There's also a seal inside the bushing it is cell, itself that seals the hydrogen from coming down the line and exiting the generator. This, is, this was the inside of the generator. This is the outside of the generator. Again, there is a seal or a flange here where hydrogen is sealed and also the inside of the bushing uh, has seals. So this is, an area, again, an area where leaks can happen. Here, here is a, a large area where leaks can happen. You have a, a hydrogen dryer, which is connected to the generator. You have a hydrogen control cabinet. These lines here go to the generator. Uh, and then your gas manifold, which is used to put the gas in and out of the generator and may measure case pressure and fan differential. So this whole area has points where hydrogen can leak. In summation, 
Hydrogen is an excellent cooling gas, but if it is not handled properly, it can be very dangerous. Because of current operational conditions in power plants, information is critical. Having more reliable information allows INC personnel and operators to make better decisions. These same operating condition and power plants dictate plants have good documentation and operation procedures such as PNIDs. Purging procedures and documentation must be well written and understood. You should have good training programs. And all power plants should have procedures for locating and repairing hydrogen leaks. Remember, it's all about safety, reliability, and risk mitigation. Thank you. And Steve Kilmartin, thank you very, very much. That was very informative. And we do have questions coming in. Uh, one of the first questions that was asked this, uh, through this webinar was, why not helium? Uh, as a cooling gas? Yes. The, the, I, I believe the reason for this, and I, I always find that whoever came up with the idea of using hydrogen, it's somewhat of a mad scientist, that you're going to put this ex this explosive gas in a product that's spinning at a high speed and has the potential for arcing and sparking. That's not answering your question. The only, re the, the only way that I can answer that is I believe that hydrogen is more readily available than what helium is and uh, cost less. Now, you mentioned um, CO2. Uh, first of all, um, one of the questions coming in was, is there any temperature monitoring for CO2 addition? Um, as, it, as it's entering the generator, I'm not aware of any. Now, if they do have a CO2 vaporizer or a CO2 heater, uh, I believe that they, they do have temperature sensing devices on them. But as CO2 is coming into the generator, I'm not aware of having any sensing devices. Uh, however, that, that is a very good point because if you put CO2 into a generator too quickly, uh, you could thermally shock the generator because uh, CO2 could cool. It could cool the components in the generator. Uh, so although I'm not aware of any sensors being used in the CO2 line, uh, it, it's not a bad idea. All right, and, and when it comes to purging a generator, how much CO2 is required? That, that depends. It depends on the uh, generator size. It depends on what your flow rate or pressure is set during the purging process. And it, it depends on the time, uh, the, how long you, you take to purge a generator. And it also depends on whether you're purging hydrogen out of the generator or whether you're purging air out of the generator. Uh, you can maintain a better blanket with CO2 in air or hydrogen than you can CO2 in air. Uh, a, a typical number might be in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 bottles to purge a generator to get it down to in the neighborhood of 4%. Uh, over uh, uh, about a four-hour period. Okay, and but still uh, talking about CO2, because you mentioned that there were scales being used in the CO2 tank farm. Could you discuss how those are really used? Yes. Uh, some, some power plants that, uh, again, that might go with a max case or optimum, the, the, as much equipment as possible, they, they will have the CO2 bottles hanging or sitting on scales so that they actually know what the weight of the CO2 is so that they know how much CO2 they have available. So they're actually monitoring how much CO2 they have by the weight. And again, the bottles could be hanging or they could be setting on scales. Okay. Now, you, we mentioned, first of all, about the temperature monitoring for the CO2. 
And uh, the person that was listening was wanting to know, I guess, basically to prevent the line freezing. Exactly. I mean, and that's, that's, what, that's what I mentioned is that if CO2 is put into the generator too quickly, uh, it will freeze. Uh, and not only can it plug the line, uh, but I think more importantly, it can cause thermal shock to the generator. So that you want to make sure that you're, you put the CO2 in the generator at a, at a proper rate and that it, it, it does not uh, get too cold or, or, uh, or, do, or do thermal, sh or create a thermal condition that could cause shock to the generator. Um, as far as you, you mentioned about evaluating the whole hydrogen system, are there companies out there that will actually come out and evaluate or maybe audit the, the system? That's an excellent question. And the answer to that question is that yes, there are companies that come out and do that. And Environment One is one such company that will come out and audit your hydrogen equipment and make recommendations on how to upgrade that equipment. And what about valves? If we're talking about the valves that are used in these systems. Um, are, are there ratings that the valves uh, pretty much need for the hydrogen service? Well, obviously the valve's got to be rated to be used with hydrogen, uh, which means the, the packing and the O-rings that are used. I, I mentioned on uh, one of my earlier slides about compatibility, material co compatibility with hydrogen, and there are, there are valves that have O-rings and packing that are not compatible with, with hydrogen. So you have to make sure that the, 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 valve, the valve packing, the O-rings, uh, are compatible with hydrogen. And then also there are some valves that are, uh, have a fire rating to them also. So there, the, the answer is yes, there are specific valves that should be used with hydrogen. Okay, so here's another question. This one now, we talked about helium and hydrogen. How about the use of nitrogen um, in, in for that? And how about, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read, to purge for um, hydrogen from, uh, from casing? Yeah, there, there, uh, there, there seems to be a shift, uh, main, mainly in Europe, uh, but there seems to be a shift in what gases are being used to purge a generator. And the, mm -hmm. some, some OEMs are getting away from the use of CO2, and some are starting to recommend the use of argon and nitrogen. Now, there are, there are, there are pros and cons to using argon or nitrogen or CO2, um, one of the one of the benefits with CO2 is that it's a heavier gas, and when you're purging a generator, you want to maintain, or in some cases, sometimes you do not, you want to maintain this blanket between the hydrogen and the air. Uh, I'm sorry, between the CO2 and the air, or the CO2 and the hydrogen. With argon and nitrogen, they're 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 their density is closer to that of the air, and it's a little bit harder to maintain that blanket. But I have heard of purging processes where they will just overload the generator with argon or nitrogen. They don't even maintain a, they don't try to maintain a blanket. They just put so much argon or nitrogen in the generator and the, it's a, a different form of purging the generator. And, and I would recommend to any user if they're thinking about changing what gas they use during their purging process, I would strongly recommend that they get in touch with their the OEM or the generator manufacturer to see what that generator manufacturer rec recommends. Okay, and are there, um, is, is there actually valve and packing materials that are compatible with hydrogen? Oh yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, as, as, I, as I said with the other, the other question about valving, there are, there are valves and they are assembled using material that is specific or 
or can be used with hydrogen. It's a, a recommended material to be used with hydrogen. Um, Steve, I'm getting a lot of questions on this particular one. Are you going to be participating in any user groups or conferences in the near future? Environment One uh, attends most of the user groups that pertain to uh, uh, users that have hydrogen cooled generators. Uh, we, we, we have a couple coming up. Uh, there's a CGUG meeting that's uh, being held in Arizona. That's going to be later this month. There's an EPRI a TGUG meeting uh, that is being held, uh, I think it's uh, August 14th in Pittsburgh, uh, in San Antonio, there's a uh, user group meeting that's taken place in September. But yeah, it, it, the GE has a very good uh, user group meeting, a 70A user group meeting that's in uh, Saint, in Florida, uh, and it's uh, in in October. But Environment One does attend these and. These, these are very good meetings. They're very valuable. There's very good presentations that are made uh, mainly by the users themselves. So uh, especially for these young guys that are new to the industry, these, these uh, conferences and user group meetings are excellent places uh, to get educated, to, to learn more about the field that they're getting into. Well, Steve, you are a very popular person because more questions are coming in. What is the recommended hydrogen supply pressure for purging the generator? Ah, <laughs> I, I, will, I will answer this as a typical because uh, OEMs, different OEMs may recommend different pressures. Uh, I can tell uh, from experience I've been in power plants where the pressure for purging the generator is usually set very low in the neighborhood of uh, 5 PSI. Uh, I'm not sure if I've seen it go higher than 10 PSI, but it's usually in the neighborhood of 4 to 6 uh, PSI, the CO2 setting uh, used to purge a generator. Okay. And um, also, everyone's wondering how they can get a copy of this presentation. Uh, I have one, someone sitting right with me right now that can give you that information. Okay. No, the, we'll get it through IR, right? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. And I believe this presentation, yes, it is going to be made uh, readily available for folks. Um, they could actually contact uh, Steve at uh, skillmartin at e1.com and um, I'm sure that we will be able to get you this information. And I, and I think it also is going to be offered through IIR. So the, there's, two, there's two paths that they can, they, they can contact me directly and I can give it to them uh, or they can contact IIR. If they get it from me, they're not getting the audio. If they get it from IIR, I believe they're getting the whole presentation, including the audio. And they should just be able to go to industrialinfo.com and get all of this information. This was very, very interesting today, Steve. And I, obviously, um, you are very popular, and a lot of people need to know about this and, and everything that you've had to say. So I really want to say thank you so much to our presenter today, Steve Kilmartin, Director of Products and Markets for E1's Utility Systems Business. He's a leading expert in this field, and I think we found out why. So um, thank you so much, Steve. We really do appreciate um, you coming on today and educating everyone. Uh, this concludes our webinar today, and I also want to say thank you to everyone for your interest. And once again, you'll be able to get the information at industrialinfo.com.